So this is interesting because encryption is interesting, and encryption is interesting because it's at the centre of a lot of privacy regulation that exists right now. So a lot of privacy mandates out there, things like PCI DSS in the payment sector, mandate encryption, either for network level data, storage level data, or generally being used by applications. Um, it's also obviously at the centre of um, data breach disclosure law. If you can encrypt data and then you lose it, as lots of companies do of course, then you can avoid publicising the fact to the world that you lost that information. And you know, probably why LinkedIn explained a few weeks ago why they lost a bunch of uh, passwords. Um, it's also relevant to the cloud, which is relevant to this audience, because if you're going to hand over data to an untrusted place, most people think of the cloud as being an untrusted place, um, if you can encrypt it first, then it's somewhat safer as it is in the cloud, either um, for abuse by the cloud provider or by, by some other entity. Um, when we think historically about buying encryption products, whether it's encryption of your laptop, whether it's, say, SSL, uh, or secure communications between websites and browsers, or it's, or it's uh, storage encryption, we tend to buy the encryption product and key management. It's just a feature. It's the way we should look at the keys that we use to do the encryption and therefore to do the decryption to really release the data again. Um, and that's okay when you've got a couple of instances of encryption at the end of it. But when you think about, um, you know, in the context of data privacy, for example, you want data to flow across the enterprise. You want it to be encrypted in one place, decrypted somewhere else, maybe it will be encrypted on the website, maybe it maybe will be decrypted in some application, you know, a loyalty processing system or a transaction processing system. You know, think of backup data, encrypting in one data center, decrypting in another because that data center is burned down. So lots of reasons for exchanging data. It would be nice if you could exchange it in a secure fashion, um, on an insecure, you know, sort of clear text type fashion. So uh, you know, that's been the way for a while. That requires a standard to enable the, uh, the act of managing keys to be abstracted from the act of using keys. Think about a tape drive, self-encrypting tape drive, a self-encrypting database, self-encrypting disk drive, self-encrypting thumb drive, whatever it might be. Um, that's great, but if you centralise this stuff, um, not only do you enable a level of automation, you know, if you imagine you can bring all the keys of the enterprise together into one, into one body, and essentially managing all, all of the keys of your kingdom in one place, and you can enable various applications and various users to access keys as long as they're privileged to do so. And one of the biggest downfalls of encrypting any information of course, is if you lose the key, then you lose that data, and it's gone forever, which people describe to me as a resume generating event. So, <laughs> you know, if you're in the storage business, you don't want to be losing keys. So, centralizing keys, not having keys being stored on tape drives or disk drives, you know, is a very good idea. That requires a standard to enable keys to be moved between managers and consumers, things that use keys, things that manage keys. That sounds like it would be easy, but of course, it's not easy because these things are secrets. Managing secrets is not a simple task, and exchanging secrets between things that don't know each other, don't have particular trust models, is not a particularly easy task either. So four or five years ago, there were five or six of competing standards for key management interoperability or key sharing. Um, I'm pleased to say that Cambridge was one out. It's pretty much the only, uh, as we say in England, the only girl on the block these days in terms of, uh, in terms of managing keys. Um, it was started by four companies, I'm proud to say that the Talis, uh, previously then called it Cypher, uh, was one of them, the other two were EMC and HP, and IBM with 31 uh, members now, which is the great good of the IT industry. So this thing's really taken off, uh, it seems to be, you know, at, at a catalytic moment, I think, both in terms of being used and adoption within the industry, the standard was released uh, in 2009. Um, as a one-eye -like standard, um, we just about published the 1.1 standard literally this week. We're going through interrupt testing uh, to prove it works, and we demoed uh, some of this stuff at the OSA show uh, back, in, uh, back in February. And uh, obviously, we are in the business of attracting endpoint vendors, people that have things that want to be managed, certificates, storage devices, databases, whatever they might be. So applying this to the cloud, just to come back full circle, the reason why I think this is interesting in the cloud context is because you know, you don't, even if you're doing encryption in the cloud, and lots of people want to do that because that's where data can be stored, you don't want the cloud service provider opening those keys. Typically you want the enterprise opening the keys and the encryption happening in the cloud. Maybe even the cloud provider wants to control the keys and the encryption that happen in the enterprise. But either way, encryption, key management, operating in different places 
And that's why you understand. We just published a survey about encryption use within the cloud. Uh, you might copy of that and give you copies of our website. You can download it and copy the book. Come and get a copy. And if you have questions about key management, running as it is, 